Hello, welcome to this clip going through question one from the 2007 Chemistry Olympiad paper. So it's important to point out that this is not an official mark scheme, neither is it endorsed by the Royal Society of Chemistry. It's just really my thoughts on how to perhaps approach this kind of question. So they start by giving you some general information about how the um, space shuttle is launched, and they describe the solid rocket boosters and the external tank. In other words, the external tank at the back of the photograph has liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen which react to make water, which provides them the vast majority of the energy and the thrust to get the, the shuttle off the ground. And on the sides of the external tank are the rocket boosters that contain aluminium powder, iron oxide catalyst, which together uh, actually gets the reaction going. So, uh, what I'm going to do is do the answers down the right-hand side of the screen. So the first one is quite straightforward. It only asks you for the equation for the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. That's an easy one to get you started. So in the next one it tells you that the external tank is 27 tonnes when empty and 745 tonnes when full. So what we need to do is work out what the actual mass of liquid would be not taking into account the, um, the tank itself. So it says, assuming that the oxygen and the hydrogen are present in correct stoichiometric proportions, which would be 1 to 1.5, the liquid in a full tank is 718 tonnes. So what we've got to do is to split that 718 tonnes into the correct mole ratio for hydrogen and oxygen. So the first thing to do is to take how much each mole actually is. So mass of hydrogen in one mole is 2 grams, mass of oxygen in half a mole is 16 grams. So scaling that up, the mass of the hydrogen in the tank is 718 over the MR of water, not uh, forgetting, of course, that the hydrogen and the oxygen actually end up making the water. But then you multiply it by 2 to scale it down to hydrogen. Do the same for the oxygen. So because the MR of water is 18.0, that, that means you end up with 79.8 tonnes and 638.2 tonnes. And quickly checking whether these add up to the total of 718, you can just add them together, and there you go, we've got 718 tonnes. Now clearing the screen on the right hand side, we can have a look at the next part of the question. So it says, in practice, the actual masses of hydrogen and oxygen are 104 and, 100 and 614 tonnes, respectively. It also gives their densities. A formula for density is mass over volume. So if we take the, the mass as grams and the volume as centimetres cubed, we need to bear in mind that there are a million grams in a tonne. So what we need to do is to convert the tonnages into grams for hydrogen and for oxygen, respectively. So the volume in centimetres cubed is mass over density, just rearranging that equation for density. But they want the volume in metres cubed. So getting the volume in centimetres cubed, first of all, we then need to convert it to metres cubed, and to get from centimetres cubed to metres cubed, you need to divide your centimetres cubed by a million. So applying that to your volume of hydrogen and your volume of oxygen gives you these values. And therefore, if you add both of them together, that gives you the total capacity of the external tank in metres cubed. So quickly checking that, that gives us 2007.051006. So I'm just going to pop those answers in, but I've changed them to three significant figures to make it nice and straightforward. So we need to clear the screen again on the right-hand side to move down to part D. So 
So this requires some working knowledge of Hess's law of enthalpies. Now you may not have covered this yet. If you're a second year, you will have done. If you're a first year, it depends on whether you're, where you're watching this clip, um, depending on when it's actually covered in your in your first year at, at the college you're at. So what we need to do is uh, mention this in passing, should we say, but not sort of get pulled into it too much in this particular clip. So the information that you need is at the bottom of the screen, and I've highlighted it, so those are the important parts. And I've taken the reactants and the products and just expanded them a bit on the right-hand side for you to follow. So all the reactants and the products have been expressed in their standard states because the standard enthalpy change is actually required. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they would be produced or reacted in those particular states that you see them uh, in the equation there. So, Hess's law states that the overall enthalpy change of a reaction remains the same, irrespective of which route is taken. So if we were to take a simple example of A coming B, but we don't know how to measure, or we can't measure delta RH directly, you may be able to um, look up the data for or measure um, delta H1 and delta H2. So going from A to B through the indirect route via C means that you can add delta H1 and delta H2 together. So they want us to work out the enthalpy change going from the reactants as listed to the products as listed. So in the table we've been given standard enthalpies of formation. So what we now need to do is think about how we could put this into a Hess's law cycle that I showed you a couple of seconds ago. So remembering the definition for standard enthalpy, enthalpy of formation, that means we've got to put in the um, constituent elements in their correct molar ratios and in their correct um, standard states. So making sure I'm putting the gas in as a standard state for chlorine, now we can do the calculation. So to do this, we need to work out the route we're going to take. So the route from reactants to products has to take into account the total um, enthalpy formation of, of the reactants and the total enthalpy formation of the products, but going from left to right. So ignoring the formation of elements, this is always zero. So now what we can do is ignore the elements and just look at the compounds. So if we take the reactants... The only compound we're looking at is um, NH4ClO4. There's six moles of it, so that's six times minus 295. But looking at the direction of the arrow, you can see it's going in the opposite direction to the route we want to take, which is in blue. So therefore we change the minus 295 into a plus 295. So then what we do is we look at the compounds in the products. So first of all, we do the aluminium oxide. There's four moles of it, so therefore we multiply four times minus 1675.7. We then do the aluminium chloride, followed by the water. So converting 6 times 295 to, 1, 1, to 1770, and taking everything on the right-hand side, and converting that to minus 1154.7, sorry, 11540.8, we can add those two values together, and that gives us a total of minus 9770.8 kilojoules per mole to the minus 1. So now what we can do is look at the final question. It says 450 tonnes of solid propellant contains 16% by mass of aluminium. So what we need to do now is work out um, the percentage, sorry, the amount of uh, aluminium, the mass of aluminium in 450 tonnes. So that gives us 72 tonnes, but in order to work out the moles of aluminium in that amount, we need to convert that into grams. So that gives us 2666666.67 moles, or sorry, 0.667 moles. So we have to remember that the enthalpy change was for 10 moles of aluminium. So we uh, do the enthalpy change, we worked out, divided by 10, and multiply it up by the amount of moles of aluminium. 
So that gives us uh, 2.6 times 10 to, the nine, uh, 10 to the power of 9 kilojoules, which is the same as 2.6 megajoules. OK, so that takes us to the end of this uh, updated version um, of the original uh, clip. Uh, hopefully it's been useful and it takes you through how to do uh, some quite challenging enthalpy work, but also some accessible enthalpy work at the beginning, so you can see the connection between your first year work and uh, how you could apply it to a chemistry Olympiad question. So once again, thanks for listening and see you soon.